Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Wild Animals of the Nile program. My name is Pelgri, and I'm the Youth and Family Program Manager at the OI, and I'm here with Sasha. My name is Sasha. I'm a PhD student at the University of Chicago. I used to work at the Oriental Institute, so I'm really excited to talk with you guys today about animals in ancient Egypt, because that's what I study. All right, so let's get started. Today, we're talking about wild animals of the Nile, and there are a lot of them. So let's go ahead and start with just talking about how we interact with animals today. Go ahead and put in the chat some ways that you interact with animals in your day-to-day -day life. Okay, we have, Calgary has two pet cats and two fish. I have a dog, his name is Bjorn. He's 90 pounds of fluff and I love to snuggle him. So yes, we interact with animals as pets. That's a cool way. What other ways do you guys, you know, when do you, do you, what else do you do with animals? <gasps> Yes, we see animals outside, so we use them as entertainment. Maybe we see bunnies in the garden, or we go to the zoo, we pick them up. Yes, if they're really cute little animals and they're domesticated, we can pick them up. We probably don't want to pick up stray animals that are just wandering around the wild living their life. <laughs> I also see some people said they um, feed their dogs, cats, and koi, uh, and somebody likes mm -hmm. to observe bugs outside, awesome, and pet their friend's dog. Uh, nice. And somebody has a cat and some planarians and their neighbor has a fish pond. Awesome. That's so cool. Well, those are all really cool ways that we interact with animals as pets. Sometimes we like to observe them outside. Sometimes we go to the zoo. Right? That's pretty cool. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the ways we interact. So number one, like some people said, pets, right? So this is my dog Bjorn with his absolute favorite thing in the world. Um, it is a like a giant thing tub of peanut butter that we just have like a little bit left at the bottom. And my husband's socks because of course, so he's making sure that he guards the important things. Um, we also have animals who are food, right? So we don't always think of it, but we eat animals, whether you're eating chicken or fish or burgers, like this delicious looking thing here, but not everyone eats food, uh, animals as, as food, you know, vegetarians and vegans don't, but a lot of people, animals as food. We also use animals and animal products, right? So things like milk, butter, cheese, as well as even leather and wool, um, silk, like silkworms, bugs are animals, guys. What? Yeah. So silk, honey, eggs, oil, and even we use them for their poop right? So animal poop like manure or bat guano is used as fertilizers to help other things grow. So it's both fun and gross. Yay. <laughs> um, yes, see, someone else said food. That's important. So we have pets, food, animal products. They also come into things like religion. So animals are incorporated into some of the religions that are still around today. So in this picture, we have a picture of Ganesha, uh, which is a well-known and highly worshipped elephant deity, which is really cool. And it's part of the Hindu pantheon. So not just in the ancient times that animals were incorporated into religion. So some animals, um, you know, basically, like while machines, like cars and tractors have taken over more of the labor that animals once did, uh, they still play those roles in the modern world and sometimes. And uh, certain animals have even taken on new roles. Like in this case, we have this awesome dog and he's actually being used and trained as an avalanche rescue dog. So we have dogs that are used to rescue from avalanches. Um, they're water rescue dogs off the coast of Italy. So animals have a lot of jobs, even if they're not the same as they used to be. And last but not least, some animals have even become Instagram celebrities like Grumpy Cat here. <laughs> And the Grumpy Cat has 2.6 million followers, which in a way is kind of like being worshipped. So we could maybe say that Grumpy Cat is a modern day god, at least in the world of Instagram and, you know, the internet. Okay, so now we talked about animals in the modern world. What roles do you think that animals played in ancient times? Do you think they're the same kind of ways that we see, that we interact with animals today? Or do you think that they're different? And yeah. So just go ahead and put in the chat, either to me or to Calgary, any ideas you have about how animals were incorporated into the ancient world. Somebody uh, suggested that people worshipped animals. Yeah, I got someone here says cats were worshipped. Very important, and we'll see a lot of them in ancient Egypt. What else? Do you guys think that animals were eaten in the past? Yes, right? Yeah, so animals definitely were used as food in the past. 
that didn't just start like 20 years ago. That's a thing we've had around for a while. <laughs> Somebody is wondering maybe if they had the same types of animals around them as we do today. I also That's see bugs uh, and that animals might have been eaten and mummified and everything yeah. would be the same except on Instagram because there was not Instagram. Good point. That is true. There was no internet back in the day, so no Instagram. So no Instagram cats. But yes, cats were worshipped. Other animals were worshipped. Um, some of the same animals that we have in the U.S. today were also in ancient Egypt, at least similar types of animals like dogs and cats. Um, but we'll talk about some of the cool animals that don't necessarily just wander around the wilds um, now, but they did in ancient times. So, yeah, so animals as pets, they had fish, um, they eat them and have them as pets. Um, like I said, you said someone, Calgary, had, said they fed their koi fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so even in the past, they had pets that were fish as well to show status and how cool that was. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to talk about animals in the ancient world. So, yes, they were also used as pets, right? Um, and their meat, uh, they used them for uh, their meat and other things that they produce that were an important part of their diets and their lives, just like today. So animals like cattle and donkeys played a really big role. So we have them used as meat there. And then here we have them, the cattle that's actually being used for its milk, but they would also make, you know, butter and cream out of it and cheese as well. So delicious things that we love today. They actually also had in the ancient times. And then animals uh, like cattle and donkeys played a really big role in agriculture and transportation. So even though today most people aren't like taking their horse to school or riding their donkey, right? You're probably going to be like riding in a car or on a bike or something like that, right? So if you do still take a horse, that's awesome. I'm very jealous, but probably takes a lot longer. Don't necessarily want to travel by horse everywhere. Um, and then last but not least, like we said, they played a big part in ancient Egyptian religion. So let's get into all these different aspects. So pets in ancient Egypt, we will start with them. So lots of different fluffy friends. Much like today, the ancient Egyptians in all periods kept many different types of pets from domesticated cats and dogs to baboons, monkeys, gazelles, fish, and even birds, particularly falcons. So first off, the earliest domestic dogs were from the Neolithic or the Badarian period. So if we talk about like the time of the pyramids, which is about 25, 2600 BC, so 4,500 years ago, roughly. Um, now just take that and go back a few thousand more years and we'll see the first domesticated dogs, which is kind of amazing. Just thinking that that far back in history, people and dogs got along really well and they were like, hey, these animals, yeah, they're pretty cool. Let's domesticate them. They'll help us do stuff. Um, so yeah, domesticated a really long time ago and there were lots of different types of breeds. We have the Chesham dog, um, we have the Greyhound, Saluki, Pariah, Mastiff, and many other types of dogs. So here are some cool illustrations that are actually from ancient Egypt. They weren't all, you know, in the same image, but taken from various different like tomb drawings and temple drawings and stuff, just showing all the different species of dogs that they actually had in the past, or I guess subspecies of dogs, uh, but really cool. And things like certain breeds like Greyhounds existed all the way back then, and we've just kept them alive today because we really like them and they're awesome. Um, they were used for hunting and as pets and sometimes as guard dogs, and they were even given names. So here on this left-hand image, we actually have some illustrations of how the skulls of the dogs actually changed over time. So at the top here where it's A, that's where we see um, like a wild dog, a wolf, they're gonna have these really long heads and they have these really sharp teeth, right? And then by the time they get hang out with people more and we feed them and we take care of them and years and years and years pass and then they come down to D here which is more like the domestic dogs of today where they have much shorter snouts and their noses aren't quite as long and their teeth don't need to be quite as sharp because we're giving them food they don't have to go out and hunt for it themselves so our connection with dogs actually changed them over time which is kind of amazing right and now we went from like wolves to like pugs so you probably wouldn't see a pug running around in the wild right they wouldn't do so well but with people they can do really great and that's why they're such lovely little pets now on the right hand side, we have in this bottom corner, um, a standing Chesham dog. And this is like the typical dog you see in a lot of ancient Egyptian, where they have these little ears that stick up really high and these curly little tails that are really cute. And this dog stands with a ribbon around its neck and it actually has 
um, let me see if I can move the chat out of the way. It has this little hieroglyphs over it that say, wear it. And wear it means great, or in this case, great one. So they actually named their dog. So even in the past, they'd give them collars and they'd give them names. It's very cute, very sweet. So we had a quick question. Somebody asked, yeah. what did the dogs eat in ancient Egypt? Um, they probably eat whatever people gave them. So a lot of times if there was like any leftover meat or like bones and stuff after they had, you know, finished cutting up a cow, they'd give that. They'd also probably let the dogs, they didn't have them necessarily tethered up in the same way that we think of today. So they might've been more likely to like run around the towns and kind of eat whatever scraps they could get here and there. And if they were cute, people probably just gave them a little bit of food. You guys ever had a pet that you like fed underneath the table and you weren't supposed to? I imagine that happened a lot in ancient times too. Moving on to our next fluffy friends, cats. So in ancient Egypt, there were two main species of local small cats. One was the jungle cat, which is on the left, and the other is the African wild cat, which is on the right. And cats were sacred to a number of Egyptian goddesses. So like dogs, they were very important in ancient Egyptian lives. They were very well treated. Even now in Egypt, I think cats kind of have a better rap than dogs, even if they're wild and running around. They're very cute and people love them. So on the left, we can see let me see, there we go. From the tomb of Ipui, uh, this awesome tomb painting from Daryl Medina. Um, we see him with a kitten on his lap right here, which is really cute and tiny. And then under his wife's chair, we see another cat, right? And then on the right here in the tomb of May, we have another cat here hanging out. He's eyeing some food over here on the left-hand side that's under May's chair. So cats were very beloved in Egypt. They were as pets, they were worshiped as goddesses or as representations of goddesses. So it's really cool that we get to see them. And while it's common to see you know, pets under tables or chairs, sometimes they'll appear in daily life scenes like this little kitty who is actually shown um, helping or maybe hurting, hard to say, uh, it's master's attempts to catch birds. So this person is showing how they, you know, are very valiantly going out and catching birds. And then right here in the middle, we see a lovely little kitten or a cat trying to help out with this. And it seems it's actually got its little mouth on the wing of this duck, which is cool. Ah, those are very cool little hieroglyphs. Thanks for sending them. <laughs> um, so someone asked about huskies. Um, huskies probably wouldn't have been around in ancient Egypt uh, just because they are adapted to much colder climates. So huskies came from more northern regions. So either in like, you know, the northern regions of Russia or places in like Alaska and Canada, that's where huskies were probably domesticated and, you know, bred for use because they were great for pulling sleds through, you know, lots of snow, but there's no snow in Egypt. And if they do get it, it's like, whoa, we don't want this. So huskies as a particular breed probably weren't common in Egypt, but a lot of the other dogs like greyhounds and lots of like short haired dogs and even, let me see, we'll go back a couple of slides. These like short little ones that almost look like dachshunds, <laughs> those are probably more common as well. But you wouldn't necessarily find like the big fluffy dogs in Egypt. Our next group of pets, which is very fun, um, are monkeys and baboons. So they were also really popular to appear in tomb paintings. And like cats and dogs, they were often seen as these loving companions. And sometimes they were also mummified and buried with their owners. Can you imagine that? You're just like, I love this pet so much. You're coming with me. Um, so sometimes they even got their own special coffins, which is what we see here on the right. This is actually a baboon. And baboons were often kept as symbols of the gods, um, particularly Thoth and Happy and monkeys were kept as close pets more often than they were as representations of gods. So monkeys were depicted as being helpful, like little the little guy here on the left who's actually shown picking dates uh, with its master. Actually, this is a child. And chi children, you can tell who they are in Egyptian like drawings and paintings and stuff because they're often depicted without any clothes. And sometimes they'll have their little fingers up to their mouths. And that's often like, hey, I'm a kid. Here, we have a monkey who's being helpful. Um, and this here is called an ostracon, which is a fancy word for like a painted piece of pottery or a pa painted piece of rock that they've, you know, used either for drawing or writing. Um, but often monkeys were shown as being really funny or mischievous. So on the left here, we have a monkey shown kind of driving or mushing um, a pig on a boat, which why would either of these animals be on a boat without a person? So it's always like these funny little scenes you'll see monkeys in. And then on the right, we see a monkey actually climbing up the neck of this giraffe, which is also really funny. It's just being a goofball, um, which brings us to, <laughs> and to give you headaches, <laughs> um, exotic pets. So 
exotic pets. There were a lot of these in ancient Egypt. Uh, they kept wild animals sometimes, like lions and hippos and giraffes and leopards and crocodiles. Can you? I don't think your parents would be cool with any of those animals hanging out in the backyard. Um, but in Egypt, the really rich people, the nobles, the kings, they would have them um, in things called menageries. And we'll get to that in a minute. So like monkey, monkeys and baboons, oftentimes these wild animals, um, they were harder to get. And in some cases, quite dangerous to catch. I don't think catching a lion or a hippo was very easy. So possessing one or more of these showed signs of high status and wealth. Uh, in tomb and temple scenes, these exotic animals are either being hunted, like we see in these bottom images, um, kind of to show someone's prowess, uh, basically so that I'm a really good hunter. Uh, and then other times they might even be on a leash to be like, look, we captured these animals from faraway lands and we brought them back here. And by the time they make it to Egypt, they're basically domesticated because we're just that good. Um, not always probably the case. Probably was a lot harder to get than they made it look, but Egypt, uh, Egyptian drawings are well known for showing what they want you to see and not necessarily what's the truth. So, um, but yeah, so lots of cool animals from all over the place. Um, on the left here, we have what's actually a, uh, it's part of a crocodile, like covering burial mask. So this crocodile either passed away on its own or they purposely killed it so it could get buried with its owner, uh, but they actually ended up kind of mummifying it and then putting it in its own kind of, um, I guess it made paper mache. It's kind of similar to that. Some sort of like paper mache sort of mask around the whole body. And they even painted its eyes on it and made it have little teeth. So you could tell like anyone who's looking afterworld, this is my awesome crocodile. He's coming with me, which is pretty cool. Um, we have another ostracon over here down on the left-hand side. So you have this drawing of a uh, guy hunting. And we also see this little dog down here being a nice helpful use in this hunt. And on the right-hand side, on the bottom, we have a hippo hunt, which is really common for kings to show themselves doing and nobles because hippos are very aggressive animals. So if you can show, oh yeah, I hunted this hippo and I killed it. It's like, oh wow, he must be super strong, right? Um, yes, so up here on the top right, we have kind of, like I said, these animals who were on leashes um, and they're being taken to probably what was a menagerie, which is essentially like a collection of wild animals, um, which we see these from tomb paintings and evidence of animal bones. So we know this isn't just something that they made up and they were like, oh, we're totally pretending we didn't actually get these animals. They really got them because we have the bones showing that they brought these animals from other places and then kept them um, like on leashes or in big pens to show off to other nobles or visiting kings from other places. Like, oh, look, we got all these cool animals. So if you want to, feel free to comment to Calgary and me, which would be your favorite exotic animal to own? It can be one of the ones I talked about, a completely different animal, whatever you'd like. Um, yes, let me see. T, I'm gonna unmute you for a second, or ask you to unmute. What is he I wanted to ask? Um, um, what, actually I forgot. Okay, that's all right. If you think of it again, just go ahead and chat me personally. I'm Sasha, and um, and I'll respond, okay? All right, cool. Okay, so moving on from our awesome animals as pets, we'll talk about animals as food. So delicious, yummy ribs. First off, um, I want to talk about animals and their other products. So let me know what your favorite food is in the chat. We can talk about it. I think that mine is probably Jamaican curried chicken that my mom makes. It's so yummy. I can't figure out how she does it. Um, and remember, when I talk about animal products, I mean things that we get from animals that don't just include their meat. So like cheese or honey. So this section is definitely going to make me hungry because I did not eat lunch. And if any of you didn't eat lunch either, you might be in the same boat, but we won't go on too long. So don't worry. All right, so animals, both domestic and wild, played a huge role in the ancient Egyptian diet. In the pre-dynastic time, so like really, really early on, they ate wild cows and pigs and sheep and goats and donkeys and antelopes and gazelles and fish and birds and even hippos and crocodiles. Although those last two, not as often, because like I said, dangerous, hard to get. Um, but once they figured out how to domesticate animals, like dogs, who they could get to help them with hunting, they tended to stick to, you know, sheep and goats and cows and pigs, with a little bit of birds and fish on the side, too. So we see these two pictures on the left right now, and this is, they're statue scenes of servants who are butchering cows to eat. So we know a lot of what we know about what the ancient Egyptians ate, 
uh, both from kind of the bones that we find from animals and like the grains and whatnot that we find at archaeological sites, but also from their depictions, right? Either on tomb walls or with these awesome little statues. So the one on top is actually a stone statue and the one on the bottom is wood. So it's incredible that these things survive, but they give us an image of like what life was like in the past and what kind of animals they were eating. And like I said, animals weren't just used for food. The Egyptians used a lot of what the animal, a lot of the animal and kind of used as much of it as they could. Uh, so milk and honey were really important because honey was a natural sweetener. So they didn't have like sugar the same way that we do now. Um, and honestly, who doesn't love sugar? Um, and then milk was really needed to, as an important thing to grow up strong. So we need that today for our bones, right? But was also believed to purify things. So on this bottom scene, uh, we see a tomb scene with a funeral procession, just a part of it. And this man is sprinkling milk behind these oxen. So these oxen are leading uh, the procession, like the line of people to the tomb. And then he's actually sprinkling milk all over the ground as they walk in order to make it pure and clean for the dead person who's being kind of carried to the tomb so they go into the afterlife clean of all their sins and everything else and they can go on and have everything they want and be happy. And also when they meet Osiris, he'll be like, hey, do you deserve to be here? And he's like, yes, totally, I got purified. So all important things. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, so on the top right, we also have, <laughs> I'm getting a lot more hieroglyphs. Um, <laughs> So yeah, on the top right, we have a guy who's basically pouring a bucket of honey uh, that he collected from all of these bees who are around him. So even in the past, people were beekeepers because they realized that like, oh, those guys are smart. They figured out how to make, you know, nectar or that make pollen from plants into delicious honey that we can eat. It was harder to get though. So again, it was probably something that like the elites and the kings and queens ate as opposed to your average everyday person. So. Lastly, the Egyptians knew that it was important to have fun, so they didn't just use animal parts for food or for leather and honey and stuff. They also used them to play board games. So if any of you have ever been to the Oriental Institute, uh, you probably have seen the Senate board, which was a cool game that they actually made up in ancient Egypt. And at the top, we see these six astragalus bones, which is just another fancy word for ankle bones from sheep and goats. And they use them as dice. So can you imagine using bones to play like Monopoly? kind of weird but also really awesome and very cool so that's what they used in ancient Egypt they'd actually use animal bones as dice <laughs> so like I said they didn't let anything go to waste all right the last part we're going to talk about when it comes to animals at least in this section is animals for labor so um we have to talk about kind of what more did animals do for people in the past other than all the many things we already talked about Animals like donkeys and then later horses and camels would play a big part as draft animals. So they'd heavy, carry heavy loads uh, over really long distances. And cattle and oxen, on the other hand, uh, were used mostly in the planting and harvesting of crops. Uh, and as we saw earlier, dogs were domesticated and made into pets, but also used to hunt wild animals. So we have all these kind of different examples here of animals being used in different ways in ancient Egypt. So on the top left, we have one assisting with the hunting of um, in the tomb of Ineni. We have this lovely little dog. And he's even, you see, he's got a little collar on. So they even in the past were like, we're gonna give dogs collars and cats collars and put their names on it. It's all very cool. Uh, in the bottom left, we have an image from the Amarna period and it has a, a chariot at the temple of Amun. So these guys are kind of waiting outside the temple with their chariots to escort the royal family somewhere else so they could go and like visit a different temple or a different tomb and stuff. In the top right, we have this oxen who's used in plowing fields, so like we said, very important in agriculture. And in the bottom right, we have this awesome little Middle Kingdom model um, of donkeys who were used as pack animals. And they were way better than horses actually in carrying things over long distances. Honestly, they just like aren't as prissy. Horses were like very pretty and very fast, but donkeys were like slow and steady and they could take huge weights, huge loads of things carried on their backs over like hundreds of miles. So very cool. I have a question. Somebody wanted to know what the uh, gray animal was in the middle of the, oh. uh, I think the hunting scene. Yeah, very likely a hyena. Yeah, so probably they were out hunting in the desert. So close to the Nile, you're going to find um, 
a lot of like, you know, when there are a lot of people there, you're not going to find um, as many wild animals. And so when people settled all along the Nile, you get a lot of fish and then like the hippos and the crocodiles who need the water and lots of like water birds would also hang out along the Nile. But a lot of these gazelles and like hyenas and stuff, and even the lions would hang out out in the deserts further away from the Nile Valley and like oases, which are these little like happy little spots where there's natural water that kind of either comes up from the ground or it collects from big rains and whatnot. Good question. All right, so we talked about this when we asked like, what are animals used for? Religion. Here on the left are a bunch of really cool images of uh, Bastet and Sekhmet, who are two of the um, kind of feline goddesses in ancient Egypt. And their images all over the place and statues in these tiny little amulets drawn on walls, um, just all over the place, really cool. So animals as deities. The Egyptians had a lot of different gods. If you've ever looked up online, like Egyptian gods, just lists and lists of them because these gods basically all had different purposes. They were used for different reasons and some of them cropped up at different times. They didn't all exist at the same time. Um, so we'll just talk about kind of five of my favorite today because if we were going to talk about all of them, we'd be here literally all day. So first off, we have Horus, the falcon-headed god, who is the deity of war and kingship. And he was connected to the king of Egypt as early as Dynasty One. So he was like an OG god there from the beginning. You'll see him as a falcon um, or a man with a falcon's head. And he's in a ton of Egyptian art. The second one is kind of a two for one. Um, Bastet, which is this lovely little cat, was a female goddess of the home and love and fertility and joy and lots of other things. So we see her shown as a kitty like this with like a little, you know, earring in her ear stylistically, or we see her as a woman with a cat's head. But you don't want to make her angry because if you do, her alter ego, superhero style, was Sekhmet, this warrior lioness. So when she got, when Bastet gets angry, she turns into this big fierce hunter and she's one of the fiercest hunters in like all of the Egyptian mythology. So her breath formed the desert is what the Egyptians said. So she was very scary, very awesome. And the pharaohs would take her kind of as their protector in battle. Um, number three is Anubis. He was the jackal-headed god, and he guided souls through the embalming process and into the afterlife. So while Osiris was kind of the main god of death, and he weighed the souls, Anubis helped the deceased to get there in one piece. Number four is Sobek, the crocodile-headed god, who's represented uh, kind of the two-sided nature of the Nile. He was the main source of fresh water, or the Nile was the main source of fresh water, and so it brought life to a de desert region. Uh, but within the Nile also dwelt lots of dangerous reptiles and mammals that could gobble you up. So he was a very like scary god to be like, hey, the Nile is good, but it's also scary, so beware. Um, and then last but not least, we have Taweret, the hippo-headed goddess. And it's the last deity I'll talk about today. And to be honest, she's probably my favorite. Uh, she's viewed as a god of protection uh, who watched over pregnant women and children. And because she was a hippo, and hippos are very aggressive, uh, the Egyptians would channel all of her anger and all of her scariness into warding off evil spirits. So Egyptian mothers would carry uh, tiny little amulets that were carved with her, symbols or images of her, and kind of ask her for protection and keep them and their children safe and healthy. So she was very popular and her image was inscribed on all sorts of things from amulets to jewelry to these little like makeup palettes and pottery and even some of these awesome magical knives. So here she's a crocodile on her back. We see Tawair, it's there. And she's got these two little like knives in her hands and this little crocodile here and all these other scary animals here also have knives and they're there basically as a protected spell. So pregnant women when they were like giving birth or, and even if someone was like passing away or passed away and they're putting them in the tomb, they marry, bury these magical wands with them as a way to protect them. So it's kind of like having a, like a, a nightlight if you're scared to go to sleep at night because of like monsters in the bed, which don't worry, there aren't any, but they would have this just in case to make sure that they were nice and safe. Okay, so I'm gonna turn things over uh, to Calgary and she's going to read you this awesome book called The Tale of the Shipwrecked Sailor, which is actually from a papyrus in Middle Kingdom, Egypt. All right, so now that we've heard uh, about how ancient Egyptians use animals and some of their beliefs about animals, we're gonna hear this story from ancient Egypt, The Shipwrecked Sailor. Uh, and we're reading this with permission of Simon and Schuster, the publisher, and it's by Tamara Bauer. All right, so already we see a snake shown up. 
and a cat on the dedication page. All right. A ship is returning to Egypt after a long journey to Nubia. As the shoreline comes into view, the lieutenant turns to his commander and tells of the tale of another voyage. I was sailing the Red Sea on a great ship, 120 cubits long and 40 cubits wide, bound for the gold mines of Nubia. There were 120 of the best and bravest sailors of Egypt. There wasn't a fool among them. Their hearts were fiercer than lions. The arm of each one was stronger than the next and the heart of each one was braver. They laughed at the thought of a storm. So here they are on their boat with fish in the ocean underneath them. But suddenly a great wind arose and a mighty wave dashed against our ship, breaking the mast. I grabbed hold of a piece of wood and none too soon the ship sank and of those in it, I was the only one to survive. I floated until the surf cast me on an island shore. I crawled beneath some trees and fell asleep. When I awoke, I found myself in a paradise. All around me were good things to eat, ripe figs, grapes, vegetables, grain, and an abundance of fish and wildfowl. I ate until I was full. Then I built a great fire and made an offering to the gods, thanking them for my safety. Then suddenly trees splintered and the ground trembled. I thought it was another storm, but I looked up and saw a gigantic serpent, 30 cubits long with a royal beard and scales of gold and lapis lazuli. The serpent spoke, asking me, where are you from and how did you get here? Speak quickly, for if you do not answer me, I will spit fire and burn you to ashes. I was so terrified, I became speechless. The great serpent picked me up in his mouth and carried me back to where he lived and put me down again, unhurt. He said, fear not, I will not harm you. How have you come to this island? I told him I was on my way to Nubia when a storm destroyed our ship and all of my companions were drowned. I know what it is like to lose companions, answered the serpent. I lived here with my sisters and brothers and all our children. We were 75 serpents living together in harmony and plenty when one day a star fell from the sky and killed everyone except myself. So you and I are both survivors. How I miss my family. When he mentioned his family, I thought of my own wife and children and I wept. Grieve not, said the serpent for good will come of your misfortune. You are safe here. You will stay here for four months and then a ship will come filled with your countrymen who will return you to Egypt and you will be reunited with your family. How happy I was to hear this. Oh, good serpent, when I return to Egypt, I will tell Pharaoh of your kindness, wisdom and hospitality and we will send you gifts of gold, fragrant oil and myrrh. At this, the serpent laughed. Little one, I have all the riches I need and more, for I am the Prince of Punt. Surely God brought you here to this island of the soul. When you leave, this island will disappear forever under the waves, but it will always be with you, for it lives in your heart. Whenever you face danger, take courage and know that this island lives with you. And so I lived with the serpent and we became good friends. In four months time, a ship appeared. I climbed a tree to hail it and recognized Egyptians on board. When I went to tell the serpent that the ship had arrived, he already knew. He said, farewell, little one. You will reach your home in two months and embrace your wife and children. Speak well of me in your town and establish my good name. This is all I ask of you. The good serpent gave me many gifts and we filled the ship with greyhounds, long-tailed monkeys, baboons, and all kinds of precious things. I brought these gifts to Pharaoh, who rewarded me with a fine house and appointed me lieutenant. So you can see maybe a familiar picture of a giraffe with a monkey on it being brought <laughs> to the Pharaoh. Then, as the serpent predicted, I returned to my family. What a joy it was for us to be reunited. The end. Okay, so let's review just a couple of cool things from this. First off, if we look at these cool hieroglyphs, 
we see a number of different animals, right? We have an owl here at the beginning and a dog and this cute little quail chick. This is supposed to be, I know it kind of looks like just like a slug or something. It's supposed to be a horned viper, a snake. <laughs> we have a little uh, baboon here. And so just lots of different animals showing up, right? So all sorts, and we have them in there in the writing because they're a really common part of Egyptian life. So the Egyptians would incorporate them into a number of common objects as symbols in their writing, including ropes, uh, and bolts of cloth and baskets and reed leaves and scrolls, and then they'd have animals, of course. So anything that they use in their daily lives often would show up as part of these hieroglyphs in their writing, which is pretty cool. So the snake, in our story, he was the Prince of Punt, right? And Punt is kind of a, a place that they're not exactly sure where it is in the ancient times. Um, but in our story, the giant serpent is basically a god, right? And he saves a sailor, and then he predicts that he will be rescued in four months. Uh, so we see the snake represented in many other facets of Egyptian art. So the King Tut statue, which many of you might be familiar with if you've been to the OI or just seen pictures of him, um, he has this uraeus, which is this cobra that comes off kind of the front of his crown. And this is a crown that's worn by the pharaohs. And it's a symbol of royalty and divine authority, so connection to the gods in the ancient world. Also with the OI is this pigment dish. So it's got the snake design on it. You got a little cobra head here and then it wraps around. And that's because of the snake's association with royalty. They're often used as decoration on everyday objects. So they would put kind of this like crushed up pigments or colors from, um, you know, either rocks or berries and stuff, and they'd add water, and then you could actually write with it or paint with it. And then lastly, we see um, a snake as part of the Nebti or the two ladies name, which is one of the five names that the, the pharaoh uses to kind of make up their royal title. So Nehbet is the deity of Upper Egypt and is represented by the vulture, which is on the right, and Wajet is the deity of Lower Egypt and is represented by the cobra. Last but not least, when it comes to our cool story, we have so many fabulous fish who show up. So in the top register of this image on the left-hand side, which is from the Oriental Institute as well, uh, we see a couple of men who are kind of, you see their feet here at the top, and they're catching fish in this long net here. Um, and on the right hand side, um, <clears throat> sorry, it's a little broken on the right hand side, but we can still see that the net is there. Um, so these fish scenes, when we compare them to the ones from the storybook, look a little bit different, right? Um, the fish in them, a couple of them look like they might be kind of similar, but they're actually, the scholars have found the Egyptians didn't just decorate with whatever type of fish they wanted their reliefs to have, but they paid attention to which species would live in different environments. So in these examples, some of the fish shown have been identified as freshwater fish. So on the left-hand side, we have this little catfish here, and you can see all these little whiskers that catfish have. So in seeing that, we know that um, he's got this like river and so non-salty water is from the Nile. So this is probably happening on the Nile, right? But then over on the right hand side, we have this little squid guy and squids are going to be found in salt water. And so we know that this has to be either on the Red Sea or um, in the Mediterranean. But since the story was taking place on the way to Punt, we know that it's probably going to be the Red Sea because this was actually these pictures that she has in the book are from the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut at Daryl Bahri. So they're actual, they're reproductions of those really cool pictures. And those are showing scenes from expeditions to Punt, which is along the, uh, the Red Sea. We're at the final part of our, um, our program today. And we want you guys, if you have the time and want to, uh, to create your own animal god. And it can be a hybrid. It can be whatever you want. It can have um, basically a different, here are some, basically some of the great examples are different gods from ancient Egypt here, but you can mix and match. So you can pick your own headdress, either one of these or one of the ones that's on the handout that we gave you guys. You can pick your own head. It can be a human head. It can be an animal head, whatever kind of animal you want. And then you can pick your body, which can also be human or animal. A lot of different types of bodies here. And then you can customize it. So is your god going to be holding an onk sign, which is a sign of life? which is held by these two guys in their hands and up here in these ones' hands. Is your god going to have a staff that they're gonna to use to channel their power? Um, yeah, so you have lots of options. Um, if you had the printed out sheet, here are some examples on the right from that. If you don't have the printed out sheet, don't worry. You can just look at these. You can come up with it from your own mind, whatever makes you happy. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. This was really fun. I hope you guys learned a lot. Uh, we are going to be back for one more program next Thursday. Sasha is again going to be helping lead that and it is about journey to Egypt. So about being an archaeologist in Egypt. So if you're interested in archaeology or Egypt, you should definitely come join us then as well. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.